Okay, so we are, as Brian said, here we go. We are uh, right in the middle of our series on biblical justice. And uh, um, so far we've done, we laid the foundations in the first series on these Bible concepts of, of justice, which is the word mishpat, which means, really it means doing justice. It's a verb uh, or an, uh, an action that we do. And then the, we looked at, uh, Hebrew word tzedakah, which means righteousness, which is doing righteousness or, pe- or being a just person in the world. And those foundations in the Old Testament, what that, what that all meant. And then we brought it into the New Testament and we talked about Jesus uh, and what he had to say about those things. So we know these things are still valid and true. Uh, and, and today we're going to try and like bring those things together by talking about a little bit uh, about a super current hot button topic. We're going to talk about the, the idea of racial justice, what the church, what our responsibility is in that, what our opportunity is in that, really, and how we can go about thinking about that or how we should go about thinking about that in a better way. Uh, and so uh, let's get right into it. We're going to uh, look at a series of scriptures from the Old, from the old and New Testament that kind of outline this big question or help, it's going to help us answer this big question, which is how are we as the church or how are we as Christians to relate to and even work with other people in the world who aren't Christian and don't necessarily share every belief that we have? Are we even able to do that? Or can we do that? Should we do that? What does the Bible say about that? And how are we to then live that out in the world? So let's, if you would please stand, we're going to look at Acts chapter 14. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 5, Romans 2, and and finally Jeremiah chapter 29. So let's listen intently together to God's inerrant word. God, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, in past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. And you have heard it said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who, are, who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same. Therefore, you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Or do you presume on the riches and graces, on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that it's God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? For even when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves. Even though they do not have the law, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their consciences also bear witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. And finally, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decrease but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. And in its welfare, you will find your welfare. This is the word of the Lord. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, your word is so much more beautiful than all the things that we are ever able to come up with, the ideas, the concepts, the philosophies, the movements. And Lord, your word is the embodiment of what it looks like to love you and to love others. And the reason it chafes against us so often is because it exposes those parts of our hearts that are unlovely. And yet we know that because of the gospel, what Jesus did for us, that you are making us, you are creating love in us. Uh, You're creating us to look like and be more like Jesus because you have loved us first. And we have a 
a response, an obligation because of that to then love other people as best we can in the way that you love us. And so we pray that you would help us to see that today. We see that we would pray that you would show us uh, how beautiful what Jesus has done for us is and the beauty of his character so that we would be so overwhelmed with gratitude that we would seek to make that known um, and that we would be people who aren't afraid about every little earthly thing but that we can freely live out our call to be a witness to your character in the world and the gospel come what may. So show us, Lord, the beauty of Christ through these words, by your spirit. Give us minds to understand and hearts to obey your perfect word as you promise to be beautifying your afflicted ones. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. Uh, there is a political columnist, uh, a Christian, who wrote a book called The Benedict Option a few years ago. It was a, one of the really important books uh, for the church at the time. And he got the name Benedict from the idea of benedicting monastery, monasteries in the 5th and 6th centuries, where in the crumbling remains of the Roman Empire, where the Roman Empire was literally collapsing in on itself from decadence and depravity and moral failure, the monasteries sprung up as a way to preserve and protect knowledge and art uh, and to serve the poor as culture just descended into that abyss. And Rod Dreyer's, uh, what his, 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 uh, his, the book, what it's about is he's saying, hey, maybe it's time, maybe it's time. As we see some of these things happening in our own culture, maybe it's time already that the church just circles the wagons as best we can and begin to create our own autonomous communities, schools, economic support, inter-Christian trade, etc. as we weather this storm uh, of decline and the ultimate collapse of Western civilization, right? Now, I personally love this kind of stuff. <laughs> this stuff just uh, gets me super excited. Right? I mean, we, the other day, Nisa and I are having a conversation, and Nisa's like, I think the election might be super contentious. And I'm like, I'm going to buy a generator and a propane gas stove, and we're going to be able to, we're going to get a bunch of food, and we're going to make it through this. And she's like, she's like what is wrong with you? <laughs> All I said was it might be contentious, you know? My mind immediately goes to, let's dig a bunker. Amen? You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, bro. <laughs> Love that stuff. I don't know. Maybe it's because I watch too many Mad Max movies. Uh, maybe I'm just paranoid. I don't know. But I love that stuff, right? It really catches my attention. However, we also, and also we know, we need to know that we have a basic command from Jesus, which is what? To be in the world, but not of it. He says straight up, I never said you should... Even if it gets bad, you, you don't have a ticket to get out and go hole up somewhere until it blows over. You're the salt, you're the light, you're the witness. You got to stick and come what may. Uh, which means, you know, we have that obligation, which is really clearly emphasized in that passage of Jeremiah that we just read. As the exiles were, were kicked out of the promised land, God put them uh, in these pagan cultures and said, Pray for them, work for them, help them to flourish because their flourishing will be your flourishing. Uh, and in that, you'll represent the beauty of the character of God. And we are called to really the same thing. That's closer to our command than anything else in the New Testament, that we are to be salt and light and we're supposed to work together or we're called to work together with people of different faiths and beliefs even including atheists and whatever out there to work for the good of our city, of our culture, of our nation, wherever it is that God has placed us to live. And not because of the, we're expecting to transform the culture into a Christian culture. We're looking, we think that that, you know, that is a part and parcel or equivalent with salvation and the message of salvation. But that it's part of our calling to be witnesses and to show people by what we do what God is like. Uh, theologians call this the cultural mandate. It means it started all the way back in the first chapter of Genesis. It was reinstituted in Genesis 8, and it's really a call that we are to live in and among the world and work uh, to bless it, right? 
And the reason that that is possible is because of something else that we call common grace, which is that God has endowed or provided that all, everyone that shares his image has the ability, at least horizontally, to recognize what is good and true and beautiful and to act on those things. And so people are, all people are capable of great civic good. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. The big idea is this, that because of common grace, the, the church can and should work with unbelievers to do justice as channels for the light of the gospel to the world. Let me read that again. Especially that last part. It's important. Because of common grace, the church can and should work with unbelievers to do justice as channels for the light of the gospel to the world. So let's look at the first part, because of common grace. Let's talk, let's talk about that a little bit. What is, where are we getting that from? I have, a fr- I have a really good friend named Joe. He's one of the best guys I know. He's like, the kind of, I've talked about him before. He's the kind of guy that literally give you the shirt off his back. He's a pretty successful business guy, so whenever I go up and visit him, the first thing he does is like bust out like a $70 Cuban cigar and make me smoke it with him. And, uh, his like family is like constantly like blessed us with gifts for our kids, for our house. He's just like one of the most wonderful men I know, and uh, he loves his wife. He loves his children. Uh, he's just a good guy, and he's a Muslim. And that may be like prick, you know, pricks against our you know some of the st- cultural stereotypes of what Muslims are like, right? But he's a good guy. You know, and sometimes I like, I'll A-B my friend Joe against some of my Christian friends, you know, and I'm like, oh, that's, man, that's uncomfortable. <laughs> How is that possible that, you know, I got my Christian friend who's basically a dirtbag and Joe is like one of the best guys I know. Uh, how do I make sense of that, right? I mean, I think about the arts. It's like great art, art, stunning art that celebrates the beauty of creation created by unbelievers. How do we make sense of that? There's, stun- there's profound philosophical insights into morality and ethics made by unbelievers. And how, how do they come across that? How do, they, how do they do that without the Holy Spirit, right? And um, even science and scientists are peer, peer deeply into the wonders of the natural world as God created it and how he sustains it and, uh, and yet are unbelievers and come up with this knowledge and wisdom. How do we explain all that? And the answer is that God's goodness extends to all of his creatures. It's that idea of common grace that God has given things and, and, and provides things for all his creatures. And that those first two passages, Matthew uh, 5, Acts 14, you know, it says that God gives the sun, the rain, the harvest, the material goods necessary for life and not even ab- more and abundant than that, even for comfort and for joy and for gladness of heart. God gives all of these amazing blessings to the, to the good and to the evil, to the believers and unbelievers. It goes beyond that. Really, it, it, it talks about how God, one of the things that God does for everyone is he restrains sin in the world. Things should be way worse than they are, and they're not because God restrains how evil we could be if we really broke loose with it. And another thing, and what we're going to talk about, the part that's important for our conversation today is that God has preserved the ability, sometimes to surprising degrees, for all people to recognize the good and the true and the beautiful. Romans 2, that's chapter, that passage in Romans 2 speaks to that, where it says, when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves. Even though they don't have the law, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, their conscience. They have the ability to discern what is good and true and beautiful at least on a horizontal level, how we should treat one another, maybe completely wrong about who God is, what our main problem is, what the solution is, things like that. But on a horizontal level, there's a lot of lineup between all you know, the religions and, and, and different ethical systems on how we should treat one another. 
And they're able to see that, right? And the Bible calls us not just to celebrate or acknowledge that, but it says that we can work together with people because of that towards the common good. And that that's what the cultural mandate is. You know, in the beginning of Genesis, God says to, you know, be fruitful, multiply, uh, and subdue the earth, which doesn't mean rape and pillage the earth. And, you know, it means to properly manage the earth and bring out of it all of its goodness and, and in abundance and its fruit. And post-fall, that was not rescinded. We see it again implemented in the covenant with Noah so that we are to work. To, all people have this cultural mandate, not just the church, to do these things. And we're called to work with them, to do good, to be a blessing. Uh, and Jeremiah really sums that up, right? Jeremiah 29, the last passage we read, the Israelites, there's a big, a big part of the Israelites that thought when they were kicked out of the promised land and, you know, in, and put into Babylon, there was a bunch of people that were like, this is like, we're going to be here for a couple days and God's going to pull us out. We're going home right away. And God's like, nope, <laughs> it's not going to happen like that. Not going to happen. So am I gonna, you're going to be here a while, so settle in and wait Live your life in the city with the people there. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. And pray that the Lord on, his, on its behalf or in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Now, why, why is that passage so important to us as New Testament Christians? It's because the New Testament says that we are exiles. We are not a geopolitical state with a land in Israel. God has flung us all throughout the world as, as exiles and sojourners, the Bible over and over again compares us to Israel in exile. And so commands like these are really the marching orders for the church, not the commands to old time Israel uh, while they were in the nation. It's how Israel was to operate in exile. That's what we look to as the church to figure out how we should operate in the world. And so God calls us because of common grace and the cultural mandate, because people are able to do good and see and know good, and because we're going to be here a while as we wait for Jesus, he calls us to settle in and wait and to work with people, even people who have very different views on other things. And that brings us to the second part. Christians can and should work with unbelievers to do justice. And we do that. We do that all the time, right? I don't know how many people who remember a few years back, there was a huge push on a Proposition 8, right? In Christian belief that, that we believe that traditional marriage was the way to create flourishing in the community. And those who were historically savvy understood that the current trajectory of marriage and the trajectory of sexual, sexual ethics that we are on right now as a culture has historically led to the implosion of that culture. Recognizing those things, Christians of all different stripes got together and formed alliances and worked with Catholics, with the Mormon church, with, uh, with, with, uh, with Muslims, uh, with some sketchy right-wing organizations, uh, with all kinds of people to get to work that through, right? Now, does that mean that we believe what Islam believes or that we're co-signing everything the Mormon church co-signs and believes in or everything that sketchy alt-right organizations believe in? No, it doesn't mean any of that. We don't have any commonality in those things, but we did in this, protecting culture, and helping our culture flourish and, help, and bringing as much beauty and life to people as possible. So we rallied around that one thing, right? We do it all the time. Charities, human trafficking, disaster relief, pandemics, Christian work toward the common goal with people who have very different ideas about everything else. But what about, what about groups that have divergent views or even antithetical views to Christianity? What do we do with that? It's pretty common for people to, like when we talk about, especially in, in the area of uh, civil rights movement and civil justice, to bring up, for example, Black Lives Matter and their mission statement 
and to say, see, look at this. We can't, we can't have anything to do with this. We can't even acknowledge this at all because look at what they believe. Let me, let me read one of the... Let me read one of the... Um, one of the statements from their, their platform, right? Um, it says this, we believe that everyone in every community deserves to be protected from discrimination and treated equally. Consistent with this belief, we support protections to LGBT individuals and oppose action that enables discrimination. What? Oh, wait a minute, I thought I got mixed up. That's Target, sorry. No, here it is. Okay, in recognition, in recognition of Pride Month 2020 and in honor of the Rainbow Collection, we are donating $100,000 to GLSEN, a gay and lesbian student or straight education network, a leading education organization working to create a safe and inclusive environment for ki LGBTQ kindergartners through 12th grade. How can we work with an organization, oh, wait a minute. Sorry, I messed up again, that's Disney. Uh, <clears throat> okay, here we go, here we go, this is it. Here we go, we affirm, okay, here, this is it. We affirm the lives of black, queer, and trans folks, disabled folks, undocumented folks, folks with records, women, and all black lives according to, along the entire gender spectrum. Our network centers on those who have been marginalized within black liberation movements. You get the point. If we got a problem with that, you got a problem with Costco, with Disney, with Target, Home Depot, the NFL, and just about every other corporation and institution in the world, we are more than happy and don't trip at all to financially support those organizations that then financially support these other issues. And you know, quick side note, uh, we need to make distinctions between uh, fighting the fight for traditional marriage and human rights and making sure that there, aren't, isn't, there isn't discrimination against gay people. We as a church should be fighting for that as well. If we were, the, if we were that person, who would we want to be our neighbor and how would we want our neighbor to act without compromising our Christian, our Christian values or Christian theology? But the problem is, yeah, I mean, uh, wow, we're perf we, we do that all the time, and yet when it comes to, like, uh, when it comes to BLM and it gets into the area of civil rights and racial justice, all of a sudden people start freaking out and backtracking and, you know, saying, we can't do this, it's Marxist, it's this, it's, uh, you know. And we bring up things that a hundred other institutions do that we support readily. Why is it? Why is it that we have such a hard time with that? And there's a bunch of reasons, right? And a 30-minute sermon, there's only a few things we can really tackle, right? So, Nisa, you got the car running still? Okay, good. Um, it's clear that way. All right. Um, but what we need to do, what we can do, is take a real quick 30,000 uh, over, overview of, of racial justice, injustice in the church and in the West, and we, you know... A couple of things we can look at. First of all, it hasn't always been this way. If you think that there's always been animosity between black and white races, and uh, people of color and white races, it's not always been like that. The, the Greeks would speak of the Ethiopians and their wisdom and their beauty. Plato and Greek philosophers would go to Ethiopia and study under the Ethiopians for wisdom and knowledge and power. They were completely mutually respected cultures and, and mutually advanced cultures. Uh, and when, if we look back in church history, Frederick Douglass, abolitionist from the Civil War era, he points out that when we look at uh, church history, we don't see that Origen and Cyprian and Tertullian and Augustine and Clemens and Cyril, all African theologians, none of them were ever asked to sit in the back pew at a church service. So what happened? Where did it start? And, I mean, the easy answer is it started with slavery, but here's the thing, slavery, <sighs> slavery was not, uh, slavery was not caused by racial animosity. 
slavery was the res or, or uh, the racial animosity was the result of slavery. What does that mean? What do I mean? Uh, the whole idea, the whole what civil rights leaders call the myth of inferior peoples uh, wasn't prior to slavery. It wasn't the cause of slavery. It's not that people said, we feel uh, we are a superior culture to this other culture, so we're going to go in and kidnap them. It was the result. It was the result. And why is that? I mean, there's a, there's a whole principle in counseling, right? When you're counseling somebody, if somebody's like seriously sinned against somebody else, if you like really have done somebody dirty, there is a, uh, a tendency for you to begin like assassinating the character of that person to kind of alleviate and hide yourself from what it is that you've actually done. And that happened on a corporate scale. Once slavery was installed, once it became you know, clear that it was easier to collect black slaves who ran away than the white indentured servants, and once the church started down that path of twisting scripture of indentured servitude with seven-year release and everything the Bible talks about into kidnapping and chattel slavery, uh, once it started to go down that path, it began creating those stereotypes and attitudes of inferior race to justify what we were doing. The cause was economic. It was money, like always. People saw that it was a way to make a bunch of money and they went in and did it and then justified what they did later. You always follow the money. And that's what, that's what civil rights leaders have always pointed to as the definition of racism. It's not Anim, you know, individual animosity or I hate you because of the color of your skin, that's a byproduct, it's incidental to that, but they've always pointed to this fact that because of economic gain and greed, we created these myths of inferior people groups and then after a while we began to believe them. And the awful cycle is that if you collectively have power to convince a group of people that that's true about them, sometimes they start to believe it about themselves. And, and awful feedback loops begin. Uh, but all the way from Frederick Douglass, all the way to Martin Luther King, that's what he talks about. That's what they're talking about when they say racism. It's built into the whole system of the culture. Uh, and even after the profit motive was essentially eliminated when slavery was outlawed, the stereotypes continued, having been baked in to all the institutions of the day. Systems, really systems of oppression that were meant in their eye, in the people's eyes, the white culture's eyes, to protect their superior culture from the dangers of the inferior culture. That's really what it's all about. Keeping that separation, right? So look, I get it. We start talking about systems of oppression. A lot of people start getting squealy, squeamish, start backtracking, but hear me out. Listen to this. We all know, it's pretty much a fact, that Planned Parenthood began with Margaret Sanger and the idea of eugenics, which is, which was, in the back in the day, there was something called uh, racial biology, where they, through evolution, they believed that if evolution was true, that the different races evolved separately, and they would try to trace those differences, and it, may, it was used to explain, it was used to justify again these, this myth of the inferior people group that white culture had placed on these, on, on people, on black culture particularly, and that Margaret Sanger and eugenics was intent on culling the race, literally wiping out minority populations in the West uh, through abortion. And that these abortion clinics are specifically targeted in and around minority communities for the purpose of annihilating those races. Now, can we, like, can we say to ourselves, that's not a person hating someone for the color of their skin, but that is a system that is set up that is purposely oppressing a group of people? Yeah, you kind of have to admit that. Even if, even if the people, even if the leadership of Planned Parenthood today don't think or aren't intending to do that, that's what it's doing. It's taken on a life of its own. 
So let me give you another one, another example. Now that we've established the fact that systems of oppression can exist. Housing. When we bought our house, Nisa and I bought a house in 2013. When you buy a house, they give you a stack of all the previous transactions from, you know, all the previous transactions from the house. Our house was built in 1956. So as I'm reading, I'm reading through these old, uh, you know, transactions and I come across these you know, these bold, blocked out parts of the, of the contract between the buyer and the seller. And it was, it was written in covenant form. It was literally called a covenant. And the covenant was that you as a white family promised that if you bought this home, you would, and you swore and covenanted that you would never, ever, ever sell that home to anyone outside of the Caucasian race. And that only people, and you, only people that could be on the property that were not Caucasian we're, we're, we're servants. And this, look, this went up to 19, it wasn't until 1968 that they outlawed that. So I'm looking at my housing record. I mean, I was alive then. I'm looking at my housing record, and there's all these covenants in there. Uh, that the culture as a whole, that the apparatus of the state had all, were all working together to make sure that if you were a person of color, you could never buy a house anywhere outside of Barrio Logan. Pretty much. And here's why that's important. This is why that, this is a great example for us. It's because the main, one of the, the main vehicles for, uh, for upward mobility and for families to develop the kind of wealth that they can then use to send their kids to college and create opportunities for their descendants and even buy houses for their kids is generational wealth that's accrued through home ownership, right? I mean, it, this is so pervasive, it almost, almost everybody in here probably has a touch to it, right? My mom wrote us a big fat down payment check for our first half, for this house. We would have never been able to buy it otherwise. Why was she able to do that? Because she owned a home and her parents had owned a home. Uh, you know, it's such a great example. I've run into people before who were like, there is no such thing as systems of oppression. There's no more racism. And I'm like, you know, one of the first questions I asked, did you have help buying your house? Did your parents have help buying their house from their parents? Did that money come from accrued, uh, you know, wealth from owning property? And if they say yes, there it is. It's affecting people still to this day. It's really been, what, 48 years, 50, 50 years, whatever, since that happened. And listen, the law changed 50 years ago, but the laws uh, were naive to think that as soon as that law passed, all of a sudden, the attitudes that were propelling those cultural conditions just immediately vanished. In fact, we know that. You know why? You know what the, you know what the response was to the Fair Housing Act? by the conservative white church here in San Diego, not in the South, not far away, not a long time ago. Do you know what the response was? Uh, they started a campaign called Not In My Backyard. Well, they got together with realtors and they had a big, giant, big old meeting here at the El Cortez Hotel. Uh, well, all the realtors in Southern California got together to use all of their power and all of their, uh, all their networking ability to find out a way to defeat these new laws that offered housing equality to people for the first time ever. Uh, and you can see them, and you can see the pictures of them. They're out front. Martin Luther King had come on his last visit to San Diego to speak against that, uh, these housing laws and, the, and, the, and to to defeat this referendum that was going to back, back, back us out of these fair housing laws. And you can see there's a big protest. People are standing out front with signs. And you know what the signs say? Martin Luther King, civil rights movement are Marxists. That was the charge. I wish we had time to continue to look at the history of the white conservative church when it came to issues of racial justice, but I don't want to wreck your entire week. You can look that up on your own. But pretty much, 
You know, even, even, even Dr. King pointed it out, that, you know, the biggest barrier to racial justice was the moderate white evangelical Christian, the guy who was not really for these things, but not really willing to get in the mix and fight. And so here, now we come across, now, now we gotta put it all together, right? We have this community of people in our culture right here and now who have not been given mishpat, justice. They have not been given equality under the law. Uh, the laws have changed, but there's been nothing that we've done as a culture to help restore. And that's what mishpat is, restorative justice. In the most part, we've just sent the police in to crack down. Even though Lyndon B. Johnson had a study committee and they recommended we need to go into the ghettos and, re and restore them and restore people uh, for what we've done over the last few hundred years. And, and if we don't, there's going to be trouble. <laughs> and he ignored that and instead went in another direction. However, we have this people group have not been given mishpat justice. They've not been met by tzadikah, by the church seeking to be just. In fact, oftentimes the opposite. And so now here we come face to face. And Jesus is here with us and he asks us the question, if that was you, if that was your family, if your family had been denied those opportunities so that you were not able to pay for your kids' children, for your kids' education, if you were not able to accrue family wealth that gave you all of these options in life, if you had been kind of hemmed in because of these myths of inferior culture, who would you want your neighbor to be? And what would you want your neighbor to do? Maybe a better question that we could ask ourselves as the church is this, why, why is an essentially pagan and Marxist organization outdoing us in justice in the world? Why are they doing our job? Why is that vacuum there? Why is there even this pro, you know, why is, why is there even an opportunity for conflict to arise? And that at the end of the day is really a rhetorical question. But look, I think and I believe that we are being given a huge opportunity in this. For us to do some introspection, some confession, some repentance, and then to be the church. To do justice and seek righteousness in the area of racial justice as a bridge for the light of the gospel. And that's the last final point. The best reason for us to do this is in fact the gospel. We are called to do justice as channels for the light of the gospel to reach into the world. When I first conceived of this series, I wanted to play this game like it, during the sermon called Marx or Moses, where I would like summarize ethical teaching from uh, Marx and, and summarize ethical teachings from Moses and the prophets and ask you to guess, Marx or Moses? Right? Uh, I didn't, I didn't do that, right? Okay. But the reason I wanted to do that was to one, to show that here, here is that, that whole, uh, the whole cate the categories of oppressor, oppressed are not, Marx cate not Ma Marxist categories. Those are Old Testament categories. They've been appropriated by Marxism and they've been dealt with in different ways than Christianity deals with them. But those categories are the same. But what really matters uh, and where we can be a blessing to people once we have acknowledged, yes, we believe in those things too, is to then come in and be a blessing and to show people what the differences are and why those differences matter. For example, right? If you think about it, and there's been some really great books written about this concept. If you think about it, what the church has, what, we have a Messiah and that's Jesus, right? He's the leader of our movement, more or less. Uh, we have the gospel, which is the message of good news, and that is that Jesus has paid for our sins through his death and resurrection, that we are, we are given uh, eternal life by believing and trusting in him. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a hope of a great end time utopia, 
In theology, we call that eschatology, right? The end times. We have a hope that God is going to recreate the world. And we have, uh, we have a method, or really a, a liturgy of how we're, going, how we're going to get there, how we act in daily life. And that is uh, through love, through non-coercive you know, coercive love, and through uh, forgiveness and repentance and cycles of serving the world out of love because we've received so much love from God, right? So we have those things, Messiah, gospel, eschaton, uh, last times, end, end time hope, and method. But if you think about it, every movement has those elements to it. Every movement does. You could, I mean, we could get into like it slice and dice like the movement of the National Football League and you would find somehow in there, you'd find a Messiah and a, and a gospel and an eschaton and stuff. But look, for our purposes, let's talk about Marxism, right? What is Marxism has? Uh, the Messiah is, right, Marx or any number of Marxist leaders throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. It has the gospel message, which is total economic equality. It has the end time hope of the perfect, uh, the great anarcho-communist utopia where everyone shares equally in power and production. And it has the method, which at least in classical Marxism, is disruption, takeover, totalitarian dictatorship, and then eventually disbanding of government and the sharing of all wealth, right? Messiah, gospel, eschaton, method. And maybe, you know, first of all, all those things are temporary hopes. They're temporary hopes. All they're doing is slapping band-aids or trying to fix up the broken down sinfulness of this creation. That's the best they can do. And maybe even sadder than that, when it comes to racial justice, is that when you employ principles of violence and deception and you have anger baked in as an end to itself, these forces will ultimately destroy those movements as they have destroyed every other movement that's attempted to, to use those principles. And so it's like a wildfire. Once it catches and starts, it burns everything, including you. And so the saddest thing is, you know, maybe to see the civil rights movement on a suicide course but what if things were different? What if the church had invested in relationships? What if we had relational capital with people? Uh, what if we had had a, a history of truly loving and caring uh, for them, of, 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 of blessing and seeking their good like Jeremiah calls us to? And if, what if we had earned the trust and respect of those people and those groups from, and, and, and from, from the display really of us extending and, and showing God's character to the world through doing justice. What if all those things were in place then we would have the opportunity to A, B with people, the, the differences between the, their gospel and our gospel, their hope and our hope, their Messiah and our Messiah, their methods and our methods. And we could come and say, look, these things, even if you would accomplish this, even if you accomplish this great you know, this, this great economic utopia, which you never will, even if you did, it's gonna end in death. It's so temporary and so small compared to the hope of an entirely new creation that God has created and set forth to bring his people into away from all the suffering that you rightly see. Uh, and any human leader is fallible and, and to say the least, right? But to present our, you know, Jesus is not just a man or a good teacher, but Jesus as the incarnate God who compelled by his love for his people literally left heaven and came to live with us even though he knew he would be murdered by his own creatures in order to give and share with us not earthly wealth, but the literal wealth of heaven. And that the hope, uh, our hope, 
compared to earthly things. Our hope is that, and the gospel, the message is, well, you don't have to work super hard to achieve this or earn this. This was all accomplished by God on the cross and through his life, so that simply by trusting in that and what he's done, we have the absolute guarantee that this utopia is ours. And that the method, again, is not violence and anger, but it's non-coercive love and service. And knowing that we have received everything we have from, that we need from Jesus, from God, so that we can go out into the world, give up our rights, give up our, our, our battle for all the things that people fight over and instead seek to make our lives about loving and serving the people around us. And, and the joy that naturally comes out of that and the peace. <laughs> what if we are in the position to be in those spaces and to share those differences? Well, that's really what it means for us to be witnesses in the world, to do that. And so my hope and my, my, my call for us is that we trade in common racism for common gracism. <laughs> Amen? Let's trade in the common racism that the church has been plagued with. Let's own it. Let's see it. Let's repent of it and know that God's forgiveness is upon us and go forward from here seeing common grace in the world, seeing where it's flourishing, working with people and issues of justice when we can. And when we do that, we build the relationships that we need to be the witnesses in the world, to share the gospel and to complete and to fulfill the mission of the church that Christ has given us, amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, and um, Lord, your word, uh, we cannot get around it. We got all kind of tricky ways to say what it doesn't say and glaze over the things that it does, but you promise that by your spirit you will illuminate us and that you uh, in your wisdom and in your goodness to us that you have given us the preaching of the word and you have promised that your spirit would inhabit that preaching and illuminate our minds as much as the preaching is in line with the gospel and with the Bible to see truth. Not so that we uh, can be ashamed, Lord, Lord, <clears throat> Would you help us to see truth so that we might better reflect your beauty into the world? So I pray that for us, for ResPres, that we would do that. I pray for the whole church in the West that we would do that better. And I pray that you would, uh, that you would make us truly a city of refuge that is out in the world seeking to do justice in the ways that are within our power to do so in a balanced way as we raise our families and raise our children in the world so that we can be witnesses of truth and beauty and light in the world in its fullest expression in the face of Jesus so that you would might then use that and use us, Lord, uh, our, us as fallen creatures as we are, that you would choose to use us as vessels for honorable use in your kingdom and we would see people come to life and come into possession of that ultimate utopia that everyone is seeking after. Help us to be people who show the way in Jesus' name.